Okay, this presentation is about happenings. And again, this is our later Europe and America's content area. We're still in 20th century art. We're getting ready to uh, round up our 20th century art and move into contemporary art. Some characteristics of happenings. Um, the term happenings was coined in the late 1950s and it is meant to describe an act of performance art that initially is planned, but definitely involves some spontaneity and some improvisation and often, most often, audience participation. So um, there's definitely forethought and planning, but going back to that data movement and leaving some things up to chance, it's, it's almost staged that way. Um, to see what happens once the viewer or the audience becomes um, a part of the happening. Um, happenings continue today in, in various forms. They include things like flash mobs, um, improv theater, performance art. All of those things fit under the umbrella term of happenings. And as a matter of fact, our own museum, Cedarhurst Center for the Arts, they host, I do believe it's monthly happenings. Um, they are for 18 and over. Um, they are typically hosted at the museum. And each time there's kind of a different theme that occurs. So what happens is it's an event that is structured around art. Um, but it takes the audience and the viewers to come and be a part and to just kind of then see where the night goes. Um, the art could be actually um, um, something that you interact with and not just view, or um, the theme of the art could, you know, cause the viewers and the audience to um, kind of take the night into their own hands. Um, but it's all about what happens, how is this artwork stimulate um, your viewer, and then what kind of event occurs. It's typical for the artist to be a part of the content and involved within their own artwork. Um, it's typical, but it, it's not always necessary. Um, sometimes the artist will be a participant um, and may kind of help stimulate some of that um, audience and viewer um, spontaneity, but that's not always the case. Um, but what is very important is that the artist, whether they're involved or not, um, is responsible for conceptualizing um, and providing or even created some type of form or artwork or installation um, that is on display and is actually the foundation of the art piece. Um, audience reaction and the audiences, um, or the reaction of the art of the audience and the inability of the artist to control everything is really part of the appeal here. Um, prior to happenings, you know, art was observed in a gallery or in a museum. And um, that's really it. You know, they would walk away with an opinion. And, you know, maybe if you were lucky, you could kind of see some sort of facial expression or reaction on their face. But that was really it. That was all that the viewer was responsible for. And that was all that the artist would get out of their audience or their viewer. Um, but now artists are making artwork um, much more interactive. And the meaning of the artwork is kind of based off of um, the viewer and the audience and how they react to it. Um, a few influential artists of this movement I've put up here um, on the left, we have Robert Watts. And what you're looking at here is kind of like um, a book of stamps. Now these are um, legitimate stamps that um, could be used, but they are, created um, by the artist, and some of them are politically influenced. But what became the happening here was that the artist would get some old um, stamp dispensers 
and um, with or without the approval of the United States Post Office and kind of set them up on public display. And so uh, a viewer or an audience member would um, be approaching the vending machine thinking that they're just getting a typical you know, sheet or book of stamps and instead they would be receiving what is considered you know, artwork from this artist. Um, and so kind of that interaction paired with the reaction is what made this a happening, that, that this artwork can't really stand on its own, that it needed a participant. Um, the next artist here, George Brecht, um, I have here an image of a chair with a, a red um, book on the chair. And this art piece um, would be designated in a, a gallery or a museum or some sort of exhibition. Um, but what the art piece is about, it's not about just a, a chair and a book. It is an invitation and they invite the audience to sit in the chair and write in the book um, some sort of like diary entry. Um, and so the recording of all these viewers and audience members entries is what becomes the artwork. Um, over here on the right, Alan Caprao, um, he did a lot of t happening events. And on this one, he filled an entire warehouse full of rubber tires. Um, and they were just stacked like hills and mountains um, from wall to wall. And so the exhibition was that you had no choice to enter this warehouse and walk around the space. You had to climb over the tires. And so again, it is about the audience and the viewer interacting with this scenario that the artist has planned and set up that and that action that you know moment that event becomes the artwork um you're kind of like staging um some sort of you know event or hence the term happening um and so again it requires your audience and so um in alan's um installation here with the tires you know, you never know what's going to happen. You could have people come and kind of see what is going on and turn around and walk away. Um, you could have audience members come and um, climb upon the tires and just feel very angered and frustrated by it um, and have nothing good to say. Um, for his particular happening, you had um, viewers come and climb on the tires and um, eventually what happened is it kind of brought the kid out in them again and, and everybody started behaving like they did on a playground, um, jumping around the tires, having a good time, climbing, um, tossing them around. Um, so again, there's a lot of chance left um, to these scenarios and what's really going to happen. Um, for our image organizer in our AP book, um, we have one image for a happening, and it is by this artist. Her name is um, Yayoi Kusama. Um, she is Tokyo born, um, but lived most of her artistic life um, in New York and really um, was known for her happenings, also known for her... Um, um, what do I want to call it, like installation pieces. Um, but she's a really, really interesting woman. And before we get into her art piece and kind of dissecting it, um, I have a short little video here about um, who she was and kind of the struggle she went through and a little story about her artistic career. Thank you. 
ですよ。私は発見法というのは将来芸術家になることだった。それで10歳頃から私は絵を読めるように描きました。母が絵を描いてくれて、前は人と結婚して将来家庭の仕事になると言って、私の絵の具だとか考えたと取り上げてしまいました。Making art was something that she seems to have done in opposition to her family, but she also was innately talented. You look at the early drawings and they are completely exquisite. The challenges to become an accomplished artist in a Japanese provincial milieu must have driven this notion that at some point she would have to escape. She was, she was on a train, train to start she, she knew exactly what she wanted, wanted to do. She, she had a suitcase full of drawings, drawings and she said about herself. herself. Her her you そしてニューヨークに行って私は新聞を見て戦いましたビースのことでそして一生懸命絵を描くこの回は編み物の作品を作ってそしてそれが34分間の奥さんなの朝から晩までその編みを描いておりました私はね絵を描いてるとねそしてその絵がね床を見ると、その絵がね、はっきりしてて、僕を見ると、幻覚が来て、全部ね、幻覚が来て、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、薄まって、And, and the, the exhibitions, exhibitions that I had, that I had particularly the Peep Show, show that, that did, did the job. job. It was, it was an octagonal room with painted, painted, painted black, black, and there were, and there were openings, openings where you could stick your head, head in. in. And, and the, the ceiling, ceiling of it set up, set up a series, series of lights. lights. The rhythm, the rhythm of, that of that machine was, was faster and faster. faster. Up until, until Kusama, there, there were many artists, artists from, from the Renaissance, Renaissance on who were involved with perspective and infinity, and infinity. But, it but it was all a fake because, because you knew, you, you as viewer, you were, you were always aware, aware that you were the master, master it, that, it that it was a painting, painting it was, it was encompassed, encompassed by a frame, frame and, and the, the artist was playing with space, space but, but it wasn't, wasn't enveloping you. もう結局。花を見ると、それと同じように、いくつもいくつもつながっていて、それに対して追いかけていくと、ハニカの状態に陥って、私たちは、その花を食べてしまう。それは結構、帰りの調子が悪くてね、あまりにも絵描きすぎて、その具合が悪くて、こちらの方向に向かって。To go back to Tokyo. And to, and start to start from scratch, scratch again, again for Kusama was, was quite extraordinary. Because she, she wasn't known there, and she hadn't been recognized. Clearly, Clearly the, the strains and stresses, stresses of life, the memories, the memories, memories that have forced, have forced her to withdraw, to withdraw. But what, what she's, she's always, always done, done, she's, she's always, always managed, managed that process incredibly well. well. Kusama, Kusama is now is living, living in a, a, a mental institution, institution. But, but by day, day She occupies across the street in a busy 
suburban Suburban neighbourhood neighbourhood of Tokyo, Tokyo, a very very well-appointed studio studio facility facility where she has has a team of assistants assistants, and she has has space for painting, she has space for the library, her archive, archive. and every morning she gets there and she's a consummate professional professional, and she works from nine to six. And I think there's a sort of managing madness about Kasama, which is so utterly sane. Which is, Which really, is really interesting. interesting. She's, she's, she's used, used her trauma. trauma. She's, she's used, used these, these uh, experiences, experiences in her past. past. She's, she's been able, able to uh, harness uh, experiences, experiences, experiences that, that might, might drive, drive other, other people, people insane, insane to enormously productive ends. She's, she's an, an extraordinary person, person in that way. way. Okay, so if you enjoyed that little um, snippet of um, Kusama, um, there's plenty of documentaries on her and things you can find on YouTube. And um, she's really an extraordinary person. And if you haven't noticed already, um, I really admire artists and enjoy learning about them because um, they are definitely the most passionate people that I've ever um studied or have known and that passion is is very inspiring and emotional um, to see kind of how they work through things um, visually but then also how um, they make such big changes in our communities and in our societies and now that we've been studying art for a year um, you can see historically um, they make really um, huge changes so um, please feel free to learn more about her. We're going to um, take a look at her art piece now, which is in our AP book. And um, it's called Narcissist Garden by um, Yayoi Kusama. It is from 1966. It was originally displayed at the 33rd Venice um, Biennale, which we learned about earlier. Um, This was a huge exhibition um, that happens in Italy and it's kind of like, you know, the art show of all art shows. It's very prestigious, you know, invitation only. Um, It's kind of like the Sundance Film Festival, you know, what the Sundance Film Festival is for, um, you know, filmmakers. It's kind of the same thing. Um, There are a few images um, on the Narcissist Garden that I have throughout these slides, but this first one, I just want to take a quick second. It's, it's a, um, it's kind of a film of her um, installation that um, will kind of walk you through it a little bit. I want you to take a look at it so you can kind of get the full uh, effect of it. It's, it's really hard to appreciate um, some of these types of artwork that are installations or happenings or thing, you know, film uh, from just an image in our AP book. So I'm going to go ahead and start this for you. Thank you. 
Okay, so hopefully that gave you a much better view of um, this artwork, but also it made it you know a little bit more interactive for you as well. So you were um, able to see these um, silver balls that kind of float around this water, um, how they move, um, how they collect, and, and then kind of keep each other still, um, how they sound. I don't know if you were able to notice some of the like clanking together, um, how reflective their surface is and how they um, kind of juxtapose against nature. And we're gonna discuss all that, but I think it was worth seeing a little video of it. So talking about content, what we have are 1,500 plastic, yes, they are plastic, um, silver chrome balls. Um, what we are talking about here is the original installation or happening. So um, this was kind of redone multiple times in multiple areas. And as the years went by, it completely changed um, from the original intent. And then through the years, they changed from um, plastic to actual chrome metal. Um, but we are only kind of analyzing um, the original happening materials here. Um, so these silver um, chrome balls were spread around and floating in the fountain pools outside of um, this exhibition in Venice. Um, and then it was also spread around on some of the lawn areas of the exhibition. At one point, um, the artist did use herself within the installation and became interactive with the audience and that's what turned it into a happening. Um, and she had posted a couple of signs where she stood at. She stood in one of the fountains and posted some signs around her. And um, during her interaction at the happening, she wore a gold kimono with a silver sash to kind of commemorate her um, culture. So uh, we will have more images about that and talk more about those details um, in a second here. Um, when having to put something down for form, you have actual movement from the balls that are floating around or rolling around the grasses. Um, you have a ton of repetition, a repetition of um, form and shape. Um, and you have a extremely high reflective shiny surface. Um, that again is juxtaposition against these natural landscapes. Um, and then you have these compositions that are ever changing and they are also uncontrolled by the artist. Um, the motivation and the intent um, of the art piece was for artist expression and for the artist to kind of um, have an opportunity to voice her opinion. So um, artist voice is the main motivation and also interaction with the audience. The convention or the tradition of this art piece could be that it is um, 3D art or installation art. Okay, um, now we're gonna get into context and hopefully you noticed on the little video, um, whoever was filming it kind of walked you around um, the installation, but then got extremely close up to the balls. And when that person got close up to the balls, hopefully you noticed their reflection right here in the balls. Um, and so this is a very, very important part of her, um, her installation, her happening, and even um, the title of her piece. So giving you some, some background and some context and uh, some information on Kusama and kind of her bravery. Um, so although Kusama was not actually officially invited to this um, prestigious exhibition, um, she received some moral and fi financial support um, from uh, Lucio Fontana. And he pretty much gave her the money um, to produce these um, these plastic balls because he he was really uh, appealed to her idea so he was like a supporter um, or you know kind of a patron of her artwork and um, and then she did receive permission though even though she wasn't invited 
um, to exhibit, she received permission from the chairman um, of the um, Biennale committee to stage these balls um, like outside on the lawn, okay, outside of the pavilion. So it was kind of like, um, you know, you're not really in the show, but you can go ahead and have this like, you know, exterior space and, you know, do what you want to do. Um, so the size of each sphere um, was similar to that of a fortune teller's crystal ball. And, and that was a bit of her inspiration there. Um, so when you gaze into the ball, um, the viewer, because of its shape, um, you could only see your own reflection staring back. And what that did is it was a forced um, confrontation with one's own vanity and ego. And so this is hence the title, um, The Narcissist Garden. Um, you know, narcissism is about being kind of obsessed and, and hyper-focused on, you know, on yourself. And so this was um, a confrontation of that. And then not only do you just kind of have one of these, you know, fortune teller balls, but when you have, um, you know, a hundred of them compiled together and you see yourself in each one of them repeated again and again, it's kind of like that hyper, um, hyper narcissistic, um, you know, reflection of yourself. And that was kind of the point of, of this um, display. But continuing in the context, um, so these tightly arranged shimmering balls um, would construct this infinite reflection, reflective field. And, you know, images of the artist or the visitors or even the landscape and the architecture around it, you know, was just repeated again and again. It was also slightly distorted um, and projected on that convex, you know, mirrored surface. And um, it also kind of like your rear view mirror, you know, it was these virtual images that would appear closer and smaller, you know, than reality. Um, so here's where the happening kind of um, took place, though, is during opening week, uh, Kusama uh, put on her kimono and she placed two signs um, at the installation. One sign said, Narcissus Garden Kusama, and then the other sign said, Your Narcissism for Sale. And um, she stood, behind, stood next to these signs, and she kind of acted like a street peddler. And what she was doing is she was selling the mirror balls to passer buyers for $2 each. And she had, you know, a lot of takers, of course. Um, so then what was happening was this monetary exchange between Kusama and her customers. Um, and what that did is it kind of underscored this, you know, economic system that was really embedded in art production, in art exhibition and art circulation. So it was a bit of a jab kind of at this high art world where, um, you know, she was kind of toying with and um, being very um, insulting about the way that this, you know, economic highbrow system worked. Um, remember that we're talking about artworks at an exhibition that would sell for, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, a, a patron spending $10,000 on one painting was uh, commonplace. Um, and here she is peddling outside and selling her own um, bits of artwork for $2. So it was quite a jab on the, um, on the system. And eventually um, the Biennale officials um, stepped out and, and put an end to her peddling um, but the actual installation um, was allowed to remain. Um, her narcissist's garden, um, it continues to live on. So like I said before, it's, it's been reinstalled in many, many places and recommissioned at, and, and put in various settings. Um, and then even the materials have morphed and changed over the years. Um, but also kind of that meaning um, has changed. And, and that's the other great thing about a happening is it's really about being in the moment 
um, you know, you can't reproduce these um, artist artwork and viewer reactions. You know, it's it's a one time thing, um, and the way that it it you know occurs on a Saturday may not occur the same way on a Sunday. You know, it 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 just is totally dependent upon the mix of people and you know all these other variables, um, and so. It has taken on new meaning. It's really just become a, a visual installation at this point, um, but not really an actual happening event. Um, and then I also found it interesting that I don't think a lot of people are aware of, but you know, further accentuating the effect of gazing at one's um, you know multiple selves. Uh, her installation, you know, takes place on water. And if you take the term narcissism, um, which really kind of is a psychological term, um, if you take the term narcissism, it, it, the, orig the origin of it is um, from Greek mythology. And um, Narcissus fell in love with his own reflection and then eventually drowned um, in his own reflection. And so there's, there's a real kind of moral to this story as well. Um, but even though she's kind of confronting this moral, she's at the same time kind of working out her own demons. So, you know, this is something that um, she herself contemplated that, you know, maybe it was something that she battled and um, maybe a weakness of hers that she wasn't very proud of. And this is part of, you know, disrobing and becoming honest and and confronting who you are and and putting it on public display. And that's why I believe artists um, possess a lot of bravery as well. Um, the innovation of this is that, um, you know, she interacts um, with the viewers. And again, the artwork is left to chance. And I just keep coming back to um, Dadaism and Marcel Duchamp because he's really um, the one that, um, really helped coin this whole, um, you know, letting chance be a part of artwork um, that, you know, let the artist lose some control and almost allow fate to come in and interact with the artwork. Um, when I did some comparisons, um, two things that stuck out for me, first of all, in Islamic art, I chose the Dome of the Rock um, because it has that very shiny, uh, rounded, reflective sphere, um, the dome. Um, so it's not a full sphere, but it kind of has the same effect. And, and um, I thought that that was a good comparison. And then I also felt, especially from this photo of, um, of the artist, you know, being involved in her happening here and, and holding these, you know, kind of fortune telling balls, it, it really reminded me of Queen um, Hatshepsut with um, her statues um, holding the offering jars. Now, even though they're jars, they're very sphere-like. And I know they're jars, honestly, from the title. If if the title didn't disclose that, I, I wouldn't know. I, I would think that there were some sort of sphere or ball. Um, and so it, it kind of reminded me of the two of them. Um, I also found that just um, as people, they seemed very similar, that they kind of pro proclaimed um, their own success. And but then thereafter, you know, they were quite successful. Um, they had, you know, very different intentions. But as women, I felt that there was almost a, a strain of um, feminism there where um, they broke a lot of um, traditions and broke a lot of boundaries and set forth to accomplish um, what they wanted out of life. So in summary, um, happenings, again, they were organized events that definitely included art, um, oftentimes the artist, and then necessarily the viewers and how these three parts um, would spontaneously interact um, artists were often part of the subject matter. Um, they were oftentimes a participant. Um, but what I do want to make clear is that um, happenings are very different from performance art um, because the artist is 
not usually the sole subject matter. So um, if we compare and contrast a happening versus performance art, okay? A happening is when the artist creates artwork that is meant to be experienced and interacted with the viewer, okay? Where performance art is when the artist is the art piece and the artist solely performs or interacts with the viewer. So that's, that's the difference. Um, they're subtle, um, but very important differences. And even though we don't really go over performance art uh, very much in, our, um, in this content area, we definitely will be um, revisiting it in our very last content area for contemporary art.